You're listening to The Weekly Brew. Now, it's been a few weeks since we've discussed the Houston Astros on the podcast, and my goodness, they've been playing a lot better as of late. If you look at their records, uh, in April, they were 7-17. and 17. In May, they started to turn things around with a 17-12 and 12 record. And here in June, they're off to a hot start. And joining us on The Weekly Brew podcast to discuss the Astros and more is Kevin Eschenfelder, who works with Root Sports Southwest. And Kevin, thanks for joining us this week on the podcast. And, you know, from being around the team, what seems to be the difference with the club as they've, you know, kind of moved on from that slow start in April to almost being more of a loose team? Uh, a lot of things. I guess success is probably the first thing. You know, success breeds success. And when things start rolling, and you know it was a matter of time before you got more than a couple of guys hot. Altuve's been good all season long, but he hasn't had a whole lot of help. And you know it's just a matter of time before you started getting multiple people starting to heat up George Springer I think the team has has won what nine out of 11 since he's been moved into the leadoff spot and uh, that you know sometimes it just takes a little bit whether it's coincidence whether whatever the case may be sometimes it takes just a little tweak and all of a sudden things take off and again it's a it's such a long season and and in this day and age we we tend to to dwell so much on a a short period of time or a short span of a six-month season and uh, you know a lot of things can change, and they usually do in baseball. It's basically the way it works. I'm going to go ahead and jump in here on George Springer. I mean, you've mentioned since A.J. Hinge moved during the top of the lineup. I mean, he's batting, I think, four in the 480s, 470s. I mean, he's he's been lights out there, and he brings that power to the top of the lineup, but he also has that speed. And if you look at his game from a defense per, defensive perspective, he's one of the best outfielders in baseball. If you look at the advanced metrics, his wins above replacement lead the American League. I mean, how is this healthy Astros since he's moved into that leadoff spot? Does it kind of help Altuve? you know potentially drive him in does it give him better pitches to see i think it's uh, well yeah you know anytime you know you get a chance for altuve i don't think altuve needs to see better pitches to hit because he just he's just that good of a hitter but that said uh, aj hinch talked about the mentality of putting george springer in the leadoff spot he liked the fact that he thought george became a much more controlled hitter whenever he was in the leadoff spot and not necessarily trying to hit the baseball out of the ballpark George can do that without trying to. He asked him the other day, he said, you know, you see those big swings every now and again from George Springer where he goes down to that one knee. And A.J. Hinch asked him, he said, how many hits have you gotten when you're down on that one knee? And Springer said, none. He goes, then I wouldn't do it. So uh, I think I think there's whether it's a mindset of, you know, you're not in a power position, although baseball has changed now and everybody's in a power position. But that said, I think he has cut down on his swing a little bit. And a controlled swing, not necessarily less of a swing, but a more controlled swing because he can hit the baseball out of the ballpark without swinging from his, you know, without leaving his spikes in the dirt. He can he can leave uh, he can leave the ballpark in a hurry. And speaking of guys that can, uh, you know, force the ball to leave the ballpark in a in a hurry, I, I look at Evan Gaddis. I mean, he's was sent down to Corpus Christi, you know, to work on his catching abilities to kind of uh, give Jason Castro a little bit of a break behind the plate. And he's caught the last four games for the Astros. And on Friday night, he had four hits. I mean, how important is that for the club to have his offensive production coming from the catcher's position? Uh, it's, it's huge, obviously, you know, from that, because that's something that, let's face it, uh, Jason Castro was really good offensively, what was it, three seasons ago. And, uh, you know, has not really – had a, I've been able to string together a whole lot of success offensively since then. But that said, uh, Evan Gaddis, to me, you know, you knew he was going to get hot offensively, and he'll probably cool back off again and then get hot again. But what I liked about him is I'm just amazed at his ability, his catching ability. He had caught, I think, 139 right. games in the big leagues before the season. I mean, you know, he threw out five straight base runners. His footwork is really, really good. I'm not a – I'm not a major league, you know, former major league player that can analyze these things, but you just—he looks very much the part. And what impresses me is the way he works with pitchers. You never see confusion. You never see, you know, a guy shaking him off and then shaking him off again, and all of a sudden Gaddis having to go out to the mound to discuss what pitch they're going to throw. I mean, he drops fingers and they go. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's really there. You can really tell that for a guy that has limited experience as a catcher, that he's doing his work behind the scenes, talking with these pitchers, meeting with these pitchers, and understanding how they want to attack hitters. And both of those guys are on the same page. As, you know, they say that you don't want a pitcher to think. You want him to 
see what he's going to throw and go. And that's what uh, that's what you're seeing from Evan Gaddis. Yeah, and we've talked a little bit about, you know, in, in the past shows, uh, we've talked about how the Astros pitching staff has kind of uh, struggled uh, to start the season, but it seems like they're finally starting to come on. And I, I don't know if Gaddis has anything to do with that, but you look at two guys in the bullpen specifically for me, Will Harris, who's been lights out pretty much the entire season. And, uh, you know, Michael Feliz, who had the rough outing to start the year, but since then he's been throwing gas. His velocity is up there. Uh, he just seems to be almost unhittable. And that's kind of helped the Astros within the back end of that bullpen. Uh, what do you think? How do you see those two in terms of potentially uh, maybe moving into that eighth and ninth inning slot? I mean, I, I know we've got Gregerson kind of slotted in there, but he struggled a little bit of late. But do you think Feliz and Harris could challenge for possibly that closer role, or do you kind of like them in that in that setup mentality? You know, that's that's the uh, that's the that's the question. That's why managers make a, a lot a lot of money because they have to they have to weigh the, the you know kind of get that balance of well do you move a guy out of a spot where he's being very very productive now into a spot that might be more important or are you leaving where he is because he's been so very good michael Feliz, i mean he's he's practically unhittable i mean it's it, it is smooth gas i mean you're not talking about a guy that goes out there and looks like he's laboring to throw 97 he just rears back and throws it and, uh, and it's with movement and uh, you know so michael Feliz, i i, I talked with you know, the guys I do the games with, Mike Stanton or, or Howe, and uh, both of those guys are talking about the fact that because he, he eps so effortlessly can, you know, can reach the upper 90s and nearly triple digits that he may be a guy that may be slotted in the future as a starter. Well, you know, that said, he also to me reminds me of a guy that, that could be a closer for this team as well. As for Will Harris, he just goes out and gets, gets the job done. And for a guy who – was basically claimed off waiver, waivers from Arizona a couple of years ago. I mean, you look at his numbers and how his career has taken off. It's, it's really it's a great example of a guy figuring it out a little bit later on in his career. And not that he's old by any means, but uh, a guy that's been through and seen the failures. But now this is, you know, after last season, let's face it, the Astros would not have been in the position they were in last year without Will Harris. He was as good as it got out of the bullpen. Nishak was really good, obviously, but – uh, last year, Will Harris was phenomenal. He's picked up right where he left off. A lot of times you'll see a reliever who makes a huge jump as far as the innings pitched from one season to the next really fall off the season after that. And Will Harris, I think he may be better than he was last year. And then one guy that, you know, is doing better this year compared to last year is Fister. I mean, I, I'd argue that he's been one of the Astros' most consistent starting pitchers this season and Friday night, of course, uh, another great outing, lowered his ERA. How important has he been to the club and kind of providing that stability early on in the season when guys like Dallas Keuchel have kind of struggled out of the gate but are starting to find their groove over the last few games? If you look back at Doug Fister, uh, last year uh, I think he pitched hurt with Washington. But if you look at the two seasons before that, you're talking about a guy that won 30 games between the two seasons. And, uh, you know, he's only – a one injury type season removed from that. So I thought in spring training that he was in a situation where he could be a huge key for this team. And certainly he's paid off. His consistency is not a matter of him. He's not a guy that's going to blow people away, but uh, man, he has spots. He changes speeds and that's what you call pitching. But yeah, I, they'd be in, they'd be in trouble if it had not been for Doug Fister and the way he's pitched so far. And consistency has been the key for him. So for those that watch the Astros games, I mean, I could just tell you that uh, I love watching the games on Root Sports. It's uh, definitely, you know, everything from the pregame show to uh, the postgame wrap-up show. But kind of take us through what the typical day looks like from you in terms of, you know, working with Stan, working with Hal, working with Julie Morales, and uh, just kind of arranging that pregame show. And what type of effort and work goes into that? Well, you know, usually uh, it'll start the night before, after the game, the previous game. And we'll look at what happened in that game and what we want to talk about the next day. We sit down with the producer, kind of come up with a game plan. Uh, the producers get it all together. They take our input as to what we want to talk about. And it's the producer's job to, to put it together and, and decide on how the order in which we were going to talk about it. Uh, they come, we come in the next day, you know, a couple hours before showtime and, uh, they have a game plan laid out, and it's nothing is scripted. We just basically have a an outline of what we're going to talk about, and uh, that's how it works. And we try to figure out, you know, what's important, what uh, what trends are happening, not only with the Astros but other teams in the big leagues, and 
and uh, try to give people an idea of what these guys, a uh, c- combination of not only what's going on with the team at the time from a stats and from a uh, situation on the field, but also maybe something off the field too that we can, we can tell you about these guys. We talked about George Springer last night and his, uh, his say program. And uh, so try to take you behind the scenes and, and get you to know these players a little bit away from the field as well. So, uh, obviously, Kevin, you're a U of H alum. I'm a U of H alum. They are very near and dear to my heart, and you've been the voice of Cougar football. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, as, as an alum, you know, as probably I would imagine a fan as well as a professional, uh, is there a more exciting time uh, in U of H football going into next season with the big OU game that you can recall? It's been a while. i tell you what, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a long while, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, it all started – it all started on December 31st with the win over, uh, you know, over Florida State. And, and people have to understand, too, that, that Houston starts the season next year. Two of their first three games are at home or, or basically a neutral site game against the number three team in the country. And week three is a Thursday night game, a short week game against Cincinnati at Cincinnati. That's, that's a very, very tough start to a season. You know, we'll see how obviously it plays out. But yeah, very excited and, and with good reason. Uh, there's there's you know a lot of buzz about the, the program, and uh, they've earned it. They they came out, uh, they were just phenomenal all season long last year. Uh, never seen a team more prepared to play week in and week out than the University of Houston was last season. It was really amazing. I think the preparation probably is a credit to Coach Tom Herman and his staff, and obviously anybody that's affiliated with U of H, we're very grateful to have him. And I think uh, some of us are also pessimistically wondering how long do we have him because he's one of the hottest names. You've got Texas and Texas A&M. Both guys are on the hot seat there. What uh, What is it going to take to uh, to keep Herman in Houston, and is it even possible for a university like Houston to, to keep hold of a guy like that? Time will tell. I mean, I – I can't, you know, we all know it is what it is, but uh, time will tell. You just, you know, you, you had guys stay at, uh, stay at Boise State for a long time and without them being in a, in a Power 5 conference, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm a realist, uh, but at the same time, just my opinion is that I, I don't think, I think the next time or, or uh, Tom Herman is not going someplace where he's not going to have a, uh, it, it's, He's not going to a middle of the road program, and uh, if he ever if he does leave, and I'm not saying he's going to, but uh, you know I, I'm just I'm the I'm of the kind I'm of the type that I say, why worry about what might happen and just enjoy what's happening right now. Sometimes right. I think we caught up, get too caught up on what's what what might happen rather than enjoying what's happening at the time. So I choose to enjoy what's happening right here at the time. Well, I'll tell you what's happening right now is that uh, Greg Ward's getting some some preseason Heisman buzz, as he did last season before uh, some injuries kind of derailed that, I think. But um, what uh, do you think that this is going to be the year of Greg Ward? Obviously, his senior year, he'll be graduating, and we'll see Kyle Allen come in. But is this the year that we might have another Heisman winner back in Houston? I, I don't know. That's that's pretty high. That's that is, Those are some high expectations, but I don't see why not. I mean, as far as just thinking about it right now. But, you know, I think there's there's other – pieces in it to that offensive puzzle that are going to make Greg Ward even better. And one's a guy named Duke Catalan, who I think is going to be a fantastic running back. Just remember the name. I know you don't know much about him now, but Duke Catalan, I think, is going to be a phenomenal running back. Greg, Greg Ward, is uh, it's going to be about him staying healthy, being able to stay upright, because I think he's going to become a better passer. He, he was a better passer last year than he was the year before. I think next year, with a even better grasp of the offense, he's going to become even better. Greg is one of those guys that it doesn't matter. He, he became, you could really see him mature as a quarterback as the season went on, learned to have, uh, when not to take those big hits, when to step out of bounds, that it wasn't worth another two yards to, to take a hit. And, and you could really see him grow. He's a very smart young man, and I, I expect big things again from him this season. But, uh, again, he's going to have a lot more weapons, I think, on the offensive side, so that's going to make him even more dangerous. So a lot of talk in the world of college football has been about uh, expansion with the conferences. The Big 12 has been the focus of a lot of that. Obviously, U of H, I think, would love to be in a Power 5 conference, but, again, Coach Tom Herman has said uh, that they don't need to be in a uh, Power 5 conference in order to be a champion. So what do you uh, foresee in terms of U of H's bid to be part of a large or, you know, one of those Power 5 units uh, as these expansion talks kind of heat up? I just think it's all you can do is control what you can control. You put money into your program. You hire the best coaches you can hire. Go out and get the best players you can get. Win games. 
build up your program, build up your facility. That's all you can do. That's all the University of Houston can control. And, uh, yeah, I would love for them to be able to get into a Power Five conference. But the way it's set up right now, they're in a good situation where they can win their league, they can get to, you know, the American Athletic Conference obviously is the uh, the group of six. I mean, they're the, the best conference as far as that is concerned outside the Power Five. Uh, they're in a situation where they can they can get to a New Year's Day type bowl. And you know what? You run the table, you're knocking on the door of being able to get into the playoffs. So uh, it is what it is right now, and you just have to win the games that you have to win. Look at their schedule next year. They play Oklahoma. They play at Cincinnati. They play Louisville. Uh, that's a that's, that's pretty heady company right there. So they've got a chance to really impress some people next year. At the same time, uh, it's not going to be by any means easy. And uh, they're in the conference they're in. Win the games you got to win. That's that's the way I look at it. As a Baylor alum, I think uh, I might be you know kind of looking toward U of H next year to provide me some happiness uh, because of all the stuff that's going on with my program. <laughs> the way I look at it too, though, is, is is I mean you have to be realistic about this too. And look who's voting on whether or not they're going to allow the University of Houston into the Big 12. I was there. I, re- I remember, you know, I can remember the mid-'70s when Houston went into the Southwest Conference. And, you know, they, they weren't allowed in for so long a period of time. And then once they got in, they won the conference three of the first four years. And, uh, and I mean, I know that, you know, I, I was a young kid, but at the same time I was a big fan at the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think everybody knew – what they were capable of doing. So if you're a recruiter at TCU, at Texas, at Baylor, at name your school, and you're going into a kid's, you know, kid that's being recruited by Houston, you're going in and recruiting against the Cougars. Well, basically all you have is the fact that they're not in a power five conference. And now you're going to take that leverage away from the recruiters if you let them in. So that's going to be, you know, that's just, that's reality. And that's what, that's what they're going to have to deal with as far as, uh, as far as doing, you know, moving up and, and moving into a Power 5 conference. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how everything uh, kind of shakes itself out here over the next few months, see if the Big 12 actually does expand, and if not, where the U of H lands. But I think uh, Coach Tom Herman and U of H, they've done a great job of building up that program, the facilities, the upgrades that you see going on, everything from basketball to baseball to football. It's just remarkable and it's great for the city of Houston. But Kevin, we definitely appreciate you uh, joining us on the Weekly Brew Podcast this week. And uh, for those that are interested in, you know, following your work, whether it be on Root Sports or on social media, what is the best way for them to find you? You know, I'm there before the Rockets and the Astros. Uh, we have a pregame and postgame 30 minutes before, usually a half hour after the game. You can hear from the players, managers, coaches, you name it. We've got it for you coming up on the post game and the pregame shows on Root Sports. I definitely recommend checking out high quality production there on Root Sports and uh, uh, be sure to also give Kevin a follow on Twitter at Kevin Esh RS. That's Root Sports. But Kevin, we definitely appreciate you taking the time out and joining us this week on the podcast. It's been great. Anytime. Happy to do it, guys.